to everyone and magandang magapos and yung lahat to our Filipino brethren that might be here. We're glad that we are able to come back and be with you folks. It's been a dear church in so many years as Pastor Salazar has mentioned already. We uh, have been privileged to be in a part of this ministry uh, as a representative in the Philippines over the past 40 years. We appreciate, I told Brother Salazar last night, I appreciate pastors who don't change. Uh, men who love the word of God, have been faithful and have been the same yesterday, today and until Jesus comes, you know. And uh, that's our attitude and we hope that uh, we can continue to serve the Lord, whatever his will might be. Now this morning, we're not going to give you a missionary presentation as you might be accustomed to, we would like to share with you what uh, our burden is at the present time in the Philippines. Now, over the past years, we have been involved in many things. We'll try to give you a brief understanding of what our ministry has been. And unless God changes his will for us, we will always be church planting ministry. Uh, I learned very early in my time in the Philippines that if we were going to plant churches, we needed men who were trained and uh, we needed men. So that necessitated two things. Number one, we needed a place 
to motivate, challenge, encourage young people to give their lives to God, hence the camp. And secondly, we needed a place to train them and that Bible Baptist Seminary of the Philippines became that methodology. I have pastored seven churches throughout the years. Uh, we started one church here in the U.S. before we went to the Philippines. But I do not pastor. I believe that the Filipino should be the pastor of the church. And so my purpose is training, encouraging, challenging, motivating, and lifting the Filipino pastor to another level. Um, that's the reason that we have operated this Bible school since 1981. Uh, we see the young people graduate and then we work with the men as they start their new ministry. And then we have continued to work with Filipino pastors over the years and uh, try to uh, push them. That's why they call me the pusher. Uh, that's not drugs, by the way. Uh, So the youth are motivated at our family camps we have annually. Uh, each year we do things. We have a property we're going to introduce you to here in a moment and have family camp. And in that camp we see not only families change, husband and wives uh, motivated to be better parents and to raise godly children, but we see young people, and not sometimes not so young, surrendering their lives. So our pictures this morning, we want to introduce you to the current situation that we have and the need of our ministry in the coming months, years. And it's our desire, actually, to get you involved in the need here by prayer. We are not seeking money. A pastor asked me, well, how much money are you trying to raise? My philosophy is that the Filipinos serve the same God that we do in this country. And God can supply through the Filipino churches. So currently we are doing our best uh, to motivate them. Now, you see the picture there of our family. Uh, that picture was taken a couple of years ago. Just to give you an idea of my wife and I are very fruitful also. <laughs> in 2006, in the next picture, uh, we assumed a ministry that had been planted in 1954 by other missionaries. And uh, in, in 1981, this was the buildings that we inherited in 2006, we were able to build a new building by tearing down one. And then 2010, this was the buildings that we finally completed. Last year, uh, we realized that the economy was developing in the Philippines. And our area happened to be one of the hot areas in Metro Manila. And we... I believe, led by the Lord, we came to the realization that we were better off selling that property, moving to a more remote area, and building a camp. Our camps are a major part of our ministry. Now, you see in this picture, we have multiple campuses of our Bible college uh, it's easier for my wife and I to travel to teach there, be involved with other pastors in those areas. All of our teachers are product of our college, and uh, we have six campuses all in all. Uh, right now, uh, between 50 and 75 pastors work directly with us in teaching those men that we have trained in the past years. Uh, we also have uh, a camp. Uh, this, by the way, is a picture of our seminary uh, campus uh, all together. Uh, we had about 150 students included in this picture. Uh, we are glad to see every year the campuses are growing, developing, uh, putting out more students. Now, the picture that you're seeing now is what we built by the aid of a foundation here in the U.S., 
in 1996. It's about uh, 55 acres of property. And every year our churches come together in that place. We hold a family camp. This past year we had 1,200 plus people in our camp, multiple revive, uh, uh, multiple people uh, affected by revival. We had about 20 plus people surrendered their lives to the ministry directly from the camp. Now the issue here is that this camp has been turned over to another group and they are using it for other purpose than church camps. Nothing wrong with that, but we have sold the property that you saw earlier. That property, we sold it for $1 million, literally. It was in the hot, hot commercial area of Metro Manila, and we were able to get, for just a very small lot, we were able to get premium price. And now we're taking that money. We are in the process of buying new property, about 15 acres, that's going to cost us, we figure, about $750,000 for 15 acres out in a remote area. And then we plan to build another family camp, a little bit larger, with a pavilion that will seat about 2,000 people we're also on that property. Our plan is to build a Bible college building that will be about 11,000 square feet square, two stories tall. It's made to accommodate about 200 students, live in, dormitories, cafeteria, all of those things. Now, the issue at this point in time is we're having a hard time finding property. We thought we've had three or four different locations and there's been technical problems, document problems. Uh, the one prop, uh, property we really wanted, we went to buy it. We took the check to make a down payment. And uh, we went to the government to check the veracity of these documents. And the, and the government said, well, uh, these, this title is all good, but there's a second claimant which means sooner or later we would wind up in court with another person claiming that property. So we, we passed on that. And it's been a year we have been looking. Uh, I've looked at probably 30 different places and we're trusting God that he has a place just for us. Uh, as I speak uh, on our later tonight, tomorrow morning, uh, the pastors will be going to another location. We have one man who's designated as a negotiator, and hopefully we can get this settled next week. I just ask you to pray that uh, this thing will come to a, a uh, final decision in the very near future. My wife and I are, are building a house on the property. We have no place. We're living in this uh, brother was talking this morning about these tiny houses. Uh, that's what we're living in. Filipinos live very close. And in fact, one time we sold a waterbed mattress to a pastor and they came back in about two days and said, sir, can I get my money back? I said, well, sure. Is there a problem with the mattress? No, sir. It's just bigger than our bedroom. So uh, that's what we're living in. And uh, we're trusting God to soon give us a place that we can have a, have a home uh, there in, in our ministry. So although we have seen uh, more than 250 churches planted out of our, directly out of our ministry, uh, and that includes granddaughter churches, you know, um, it's not enough. We're trusting God in our lifetime to give us much more that we can see God's ministry continue to grow. The investment that you have made will be profitable in the ministry there in the, or the investment in our ministry will be profitable in seeing churches planted and the ministry continue to grow. Now, all that we hope to do in the future is built on faith in God. 
all that we intend to do in the ministry for the past 38 years has been built on faith in God. Uh, when my wife and I went to the Philippines, and by the way, I failed to introduce my wife. Would you stand, please? She's always sits there and she's nervous that I'm going to make her come say something. No, not today. Everything we have done when we went to the Philippines, I prayed, Lord, would you give me 50 churches in my lifetime? We passed that and God has taken that ministry and He's just done amazing, amazing things. And I contend that God is an amazing God. He will use us, he will use you to do amazing things. And you want to know how great God is? Look at your life. Look at what God has created in this world. Look at those people around you. Now this morning, I want to use our time to examine how God can work in your life, how God can work in our lives. How did these things happen? How, how, how does the ministry grow? Uh, not just myself, you support other amazing missionaries around the world that have done equally great ministries for God. You support men who have done much more than me. There's no, there's no pattern or there's no standard of personal gain in any of this. It's all about faith in God. Faith is much more, by the way, than just trusting God for your daily needs. Faith is about us as a complete person putting our confidence and daily walk is placed on him. Before we get into this main topic, though, I would like to challenge you this morning. The prayer was, if there's one here without Christ. You know, here's the thing. If you have a hard time or if it seems ridiculous or if what I'm going to talk about this morning seems too far out there or difficult to accomplish, maybe you should think about the possibility that you're not yet God's child. A lot of people grow up in churches. A lot of people are realizing their need for Christ later on in life, thinking they were saved when they were young. And I would challenge you to think like that if it's difficult, if you have a hard time trusting in God. Now, talking about faith is actually one of my favorite subjects. I think it's a prime thing of a child of God in our lives. Most of you already know you understand the idea of faith. I know in this church you have been taught about faith. You have read the scriptures. You, you know the concept. And I'm confident you like the idea of faith. Maybe you're even excited by this faith, trusting God. But I'm also confident that if I ask everyone here, you would agree with the concept of faith. Nobody will argue about that. By faith, you're saved by grace. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. So we know what faith is. We know the concept. We know what it's about. Sad to say, though, the reality is that most people do not exercise faith very well. I may have told this illustration or this story in the past, I don't know, but I think it bears repeating. When I was a young missionary in the Philippines, the first church that I pastored was already established. I was taking the furlough time for a missionary 
and uh, he was going to be gone for a few months and ask if I would oversee the work. Uh, I was just a year or two in the Philippines. I said, sure. And so we did that. So I was going around meeting the families who were in the church, and this one young mother, single lady, had four children. And they were just really precious people. They're still my friends, even till today. But the children came up in front of me, and each one gave me their name and how old they were. And they would say, hello, Pastor. I, my name is Janine, and I'm 13. And each one, until the last one, was a little girl. Now, I had at that time, I had a seven-year-old son, and this little girl was just the same size as my son, and she walked up, and she was so cute. Now, you understand, I had five ugly boys. <laughs> so I quickly fall in love with little girls. <laughs> That's the truth. And this little darling stood in front of me and she said, hello, Pastor, my name is Gigi. I said, well, hello, Gigi. How old are you? She said, 21. <laughs> well, like you, I sort of chuckled and I looked at her mother and she said, yes, Pastor, when, her, when she was seven years old, her body stopped growing. How many times I have thought about Gigi, the fact that she would never know what it is to have a precious love of a husband. She would never know what it is to bring life into this world. She would never know what it is to be complete as a woman. And I think by that same idea, there are so many Christians who are born again. They love God and they even come to church on a regular basis. But somewhere in their Christian life, their faith stopped growing. They never know what it is to be fruitful for God, to be a soul winner. They never know what it is to grow in the Lord and be complete in God. To have that power of God and to have that complete confidence in him and their life. So this morning, I want to emphasize faith as a lifestyle. Meaning that faith is part of everything in your life. And that includes everything you do, everything you think, every decision that you make, every place you go. It should include everything in our lifetime. Now, first of all, let's examine what faith should be to us. The first thing I think you should realize is that faith is our assurance. You're born again. You love the Lord. You've been made his child. The very foundation of your hope for eternity is your faith in God. We all realize it's not our works. It's not by anything we could do that we became his child. So when we think about our life, it's made up of so many things that we cannot be sure of. We cannot be sure about other people. We cannot be sure about tomorrow. We cannot be sure about money. We can't even be sure about what President Trump will or will not do. I mean, it seems to change every day, and I'm not against him, but he does have that tendency. There are so many things that we are unsure about, talking about the weather, the traffic, the uh, things around us, and whether it's the government or just businesses, how they raise prices, taxes go up, all of these things are things that are uncertain. I think you get my point. Life is unsure. So I contend it's a real blessing to have the assurance about anything. If I could trust my friends, I trust my wife, I trust my children, that's a blessing. But how much more 
if we can trust God. We can have that assurance, something that we do not ever need to worry about. Now look at the Bible with me a moment. Look with me in Philippians chapter 4. This is what faith does for us. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God, in verse 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. That is what will keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Do you ever have problems of some needs in your life, you know, like money for car payment or utilities, money for medical expense, money for food. Do you ever wonder how am I going to pay for that air conditioner that broke preacher and I were talking about last night? A thousand dollars. Where in the world am I going to get a thousand dollars? Do you ever wonder how am I going to be able to pay for this expense or that expense and it just worries you, keeps you awake at night. How can you face those needs for the future without being anxious, without being nervous? Do you know people who go through life without a care? You know, it seems like every time you see them, they're just bubbly and they're happy and they're laughing and they don't have any worry at all. How do they do that? Maybe you wonder how in the world anybody could live without fear and worry and concern and everything is a problem. Because for you, it seems like the problems are just overwhelming. They're beyond your capacity. You you just worry constantly. But I would suggest to you that you have a problem believing. Now listen, I mean really believing completely that God can do all those things that we read about in the scriptures. You struggle with it. The second thing about faith is when we begin to actually have faith in God, that is when we have real awareness of who he is, of what he can do. By faith, we understand. By faith, we can see. Now, we as believers, you believe in the truth of God. You believe in the scriptures. You are aware that things I mean, that non-believers don't believe those same things. That's one of the reasons we see the polarity in the U.S. today. People who believe this one and people who believe this one. And all it is is attack. But we can believe God because we have the Holy Spirit. We can believe the scripture. We can understand. That's the work of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, is to enlighten us. I'd like to make a point here, by the way. Faith is not something that God is expecting us to accept without evidence. I'm of the mind that God does not expect us to have faith in him without evidence of the reality. I believe we can know it by experience, experiencing it for one thing. Faith is not something invisible. It's not like, you know, hocus pocus and black smoke floating through the air or white smoke floating through the air or the air that we breathe. Faith is reality. It's absolute. You want to know how great God is? Look at this earth. It came from God. This planet that we live on was not an accident by some ridiculous methodology. God made it what it is. You want to know how supernatural? Well, I suggest that you look at the beauty and the majesty 
You want to know how powerful it is? Look at your own life and how he has blessed you. How God has given this nation unbelievable wealth and majesty in the operation of the universe. You want to know if he can change people's lives? I suggest you look around this auditorium. Many of us have had dark lives, things we're ashamed of, things that we've done before Jesus Christ came into our lives and made us completely different. Our awareness should make us curious. It should drive us to a desire to know more. How can I be closer to God? I know who he is. I know he is real. I want to draw closer to him. I want to walk closer to him. Now, when that happens, then he will give us an anticipation by faith. To anticipate. To be excited. To see what tomorrow will do. What will God do for me? Looking for things to happen. I believe once we have faith in God, life has new excitement, new expectations, new, new horizons, if you will, because of that anticipation. You know, when you and I exercise faith, we are literally looking to the future. We're trusting him for tomorrow. Where we can say, I'm able to see by faith what the human eye cannot see. You know, there's a story I want to take you to. Go to 2 Kings chapter 6, if you will. 2 Kings chapter 6. And in this scripture, we find a man named Elisha. Verse 8, we begin the story. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants saying in such and such a place shall be my camp and the man of God sent unto the king of Israel saying beware that thou pass not such a place for thither the Syrians are come down and the king of Israel sent to the sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once nor twice. Verse 11, therefore the king or the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing and he called his servants and said unto them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And every one of his servants said, none my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy height in thy bedchamber. And he said, go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent the king sent thither horses, chariots, great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with him. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people. Smite them, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elijah. Now here's the story in, in a nutshell. Elisha, of course, is the prophet. The young man is his servant. Now, somehow, when the king of Syria went to battle with Israel, Elisha was knowing the plans. 
And the king of Syria wanted to capture the king of Israel. And so he would give instructions to his warriors. And the intention was to capture the king. But Elisha would send a warning to the king. Don't go there. Don't go there. And we see in the Bible multiple times Elisha saved the life of the king of Israel. Now, the king of Syria is a little upset. We have a mole among us. We have a snitch. We have a leak. Somebody's sending tweets. I don't know who's doing this. Well, the servants of the king of Syria said, Sir, the only thing we know, it's Elisha. He's the one telling. Now, in my mind, I think these people understand what Elisha was. He was a man of God. And so the king said, listen, you go find out where Elisha is and I want to capture him. So somebody said, well, sir, he's down in Dothan. And so the king sent chariots of fire, I mean, chariots and horses and soldiers. And they went down and circled the city of Dothan to capture Elisha. They got down there, they circled it. Elisha and his servant are in the town. And sure enough, they're there. And the young man says to the prophet, sir, what are we going to do? You know, we're going to be slaughtered here. Elisha said, hey man, don't worry. Lord, let him see. Let this young man see your power. And the Lord did. The young man looked around and the whole place, there were more of God's people there than there was the enemy. I contend that's our life. Now, I don't know. Somebody says we all have guardian angels. Uh, I often pray, Lord, don't let me drive faster than my angel can fly. But the point is, we do know that God was protecting. And him. what I want you to see in verse 14, where they sent the horses, the chariots, and so many soldiers, and all of this makes the young man nervous. Elijah made it very clear why he had faith in God. Absolute, total faith in God. The reality is that we should be able to have that same kind of faith in the same God as Elijah served, Elisha served. And I suggest to you that is what will cause us to be full of anticipation about tomorrow, what God has for me tomorrow. You see, something else comes with our knowledge of those kind of great things of God. We begin to believe that he is accessible to us. He's always available. How do we reach God? How, how do we as individuals, how can we go to God? Well, let me make very clear that it's not by our works. Not because I'm a handsome fellow. That's certainly evident. Not because I'm somebody special. That's evident. Not because I'm an American. Filipinos serve the same God and God is blessing that nation in a mag magnificent way, amazing way. People are being sent out as missionaries right now. Asia Baptist Clearing House is clearing for about 150 Filipino missionary couples going into the Far East and Africa and so on. We even have some coming to the U.S. And I tell you, more and more, we're needing missionaries here. What I'm thinking is that we should understand becoming like Christ is the issue. How can I become like Christ? You see, that's what we're commanded to do. We're born again that we can be like Christ. That was the predestinated thing that we would be conformed to his image. That is what God decides for us. That is what God wants for us, that we be like his son. We think like him, we act like him, we would do 
the will of God. And so with that thought then, the, when we talk about works and our attitude, it's all about God. Everything we're doing here this morning should be about God. Worship. Information. The challenge to be more than we are, to be encouraged how God can use us. There are three reasons, I believe, why we should also obey the standards and the principles of the word of God. First of all, it draws people to Christ. Love your neighbor. You want to, somebody said, you want to make your enemy your friend, love them. You want to bring someone to Christ, love them. Give them the love of God. That's one reason that we want to follow God's standards. Another reason is it's just plain good for our flesh. There are the Ten Commandments. Five of those are very good for us as human beings to live together in peace and harmony. But the one that's the most difficult for people to grasp is that we do it just because it pleases God. You know, there are instructions in the Bible. I don't understand why. I don't understand why we can't wear skirts, guys. It's a lot cooler. I don't understand why women want to wear pants. It's hot. You know, here's a woman. She wants to cut her hair because it's too hot, but she puts on pants. Explain that to me. I don't understand the standard of long hair, short hair. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it tells us why. It gives us instructions, but it doesn't tell us why. All I know is that for my wife to wear the clothing of a male and for me to wear the clothing of a female, the Bible says very clearly it's an abomination to God. That's all I know. And if I do not want to be an abomination to God, then I should do what the Bible says. Why? Because it pleases him. It pleases my heavenly father. It pleases the one who gave me eternal life. It pleases the one that I can have faith in to deal with my daily problems, to guide my life and to provide. An abomination, that's a hard word, isn't it? Well, the only way to have a closer walk with God is to walk in faith. No other way. We cannot make it happen. We cannot do it ourselves. You may be the wealthiest, the poorest. You may be the smartest and maybe not so smart. Or maybe you're highly educated here, doctors and so on. And maybe you're... High school graduate are educated, have no education. All that doesn't matter. Every one of us at the foot of the cross, we're the same. Everything we receive, we should receive by faith. Everything that God is to us should be by faith. Our access to him is by faith. Anyone who comes to God must believe that he is. He is what? That's the question. What is God to you? Do you understand he's a personal God? He's not this white-haired old man sitting up there afar off watching us. God is a personal God. He's right here with us. He is the God who cares about you, whether you are the elder or the young people, whether you are the fat or the any, whether you are the wealthy or the poor, he cares for us equally. He cares about your fears. He cares about your hopes, your dreams, everything. All of that becomes real because of faith. He becomes our then, our authority. In Acts chapter 3, there's a few verses here, verses 1 to 8, if you'd like to look at them with me. 
Acts chapter 3, we find the actions of Peter and John. And Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered in with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. I'm not suggesting that Pastor Salazar can put his hand on anybody here and heal you. We understand the, the timeline of the word of God. But here's what I want you to understand is the concept of this man who had been healed. And I tell you, every one of us who have accepted Christ and our life has been changed, we have been healed. Peter exercised the faith that he had in Christ. That's what happened. He had his faith based on God. His faith was that Jesus Christ of Nazareth had the power to raise this man up out of his sick bed, literally make him able to walk. Peter had authority from God. Now listen to me. If you seem to have a difficult time to trust God completely, I suggest you start with the little things. Can you trust God for a small thing? Now, once you learn that and you see God work in it, now you can trust him for the bigger thing. And then you can trust him with everything. And that's where we should be walking. Start with the things that you are anxious about right now. Something that's causing you anxiety. Something you can't get out of your mind. It, it just permeates your very thinking. Those things that are pressuring you beyond your control. The things that you are so nervous about, learn to take that to God. And most of all, learn to go to God with every decision in your life. What is something you want God to change in your life? Remember, you are anticipating you're looking forward to what God can do, not what you can do. That's where we have to change our thinking. What can God do? So when you have that faith in God, now this is the culmination of all of our faith. It's going to require some action. Have you ever heard someone say love is an action word? Faith is an action word. It's not just a way of thinking. You see, faith is a word of action. Faith involves a person's mind to think positively. Faith involves a person's will. I will put my trust in God. Faith involves your hands, your feet. You have to get up and do your part. Remember when Peter raised up that man? He said, take up your bed and walk. And that's exactly what the man did. He got up and he walked. But more than that, did you notice that he didn't just get up and walk? The Bible says he got up and leapt and walked. He jumped up with excitement, it seems to me. 
And not only that, then he went into the house of God, leaping and praising God. That's the way we ought to come to church. Excited. Man, I get to go to church today. I, this is fantastic. I get to be around God's people. I get to sing the praises of, of Jesus. I get to talk about God. I get to be challenged about him. I'm going uh, go leaping. You cannot tell God that you trust him or believe in him and do nothing about it. You just can't. Somebody might use the illustration of a, one of these handsome young men down here. There's, there's a couple of handsome. You know who you are. <laughs> and you see that real cute girl. Somebody asked me a while ago, somebody said, how did I get so fortunate to have a beautiful lady? I don't know. God just been good to me. And maybe God will do that for you. You see that cute girl and you, you decide you love her and, and eventually you just love her so much you want to get married. What will you do about it? You going to talk about it? You going to tweet her? You going to text her? Instagram? I don't know what all you guys are going to do. But you're not going to sit silent, right? You're going to tell her. That's action, guys. You're going to tell about God, you're going to be involved in something because if you don't, you are not really trusting God. Where is the leaping? Too many people have a weak hearted, half hearted belief in what God is. I tell you, it's so important that we have that assurance, that awareness. That anticipation, we have that authority, and then we put it to action. Action that faith generates in a person's life. Now, you have the capacity to believe God for something. Everyone here does. You have as much ability to trust God as any other person in this room. Your pastor is not the only one who can trust God. I would venture to say there are some people in this auditorium that trust God maybe even more than the pastor. And that's nothing wrong with that. All of us should be going in the direction as best we can. If you actually believe that God will always answer your prayers without fail, what would you be willing to ask God for? If you really believe it. Matthew 7, 7, ask and you shall be given you. Seek and it shall be, and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and he that knocketh it shall be opened. Mark 9, 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and cried with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Folks, as a child of God, your relationship with your heavenly father is based on your faith. It's not based on what you put in the offering plate. Not based on how you smile, how you sing the songs. It's based on your faith in God. That was the statement in Hebrews eleven seven. 7. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's what he's talking about. If our life is going to be of value, then we must live in the power of God. We must be living in faith. That's the key. If this church is going to have God's power, it's going to depend on you because you are the church. If there's no power in your life, where is the power in the church? You bring the power into the church. It's up to you for this church to have the power of God. The big question for everyone here today, what is the faith in your life? Do you exercise your faith in God, the God of the universe? If there is no exercise of your faith, you're missing, you're missing, you're missing 
the blessings of God in your life, you're missing what God wants to do with you, for you, through you, by you, that this church can still be the amazing powerhouse it has been in producing godly people. There's a long time left if Christ doesn't come back soon. The question is, what will this church do in the future? You've done great things for God in the past. I love to praise God for what he's allowed me to be involved in in the Philippines, but I'm more concerned now, what will we do in the future? And that should be the desire of every member of Cornerstone Baptist Church. What will God allow me to do in the future? I'm going to ask pastor to come. Would you stand with me, please? This moment, we'll have a uh, hymn of invitation. I just want to reiterate what he said, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. You know, we're all here today either to participate in religion or to celebrate a relationship. That's why we're here today. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Let me ask you a personal question. You know, all of us, especially here at Cornerstone Baptist Church in this past week and this next coming up week, have had to face the question of life and death. We've had people close to us that have gone on to be with the Lord. What makes a difference when you go to a funeral and you see people rejoicing? Well, they're rejoicing because the person that had died had a relationship with Jesus Christ. They knew them as their Lord and personal Savior. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save you. I tell you this morning, we have folks here that have the word of God that can show you how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know. We'd love for you to come and to, to allow someone to take the word of God and can show you how you can have that relationship. Or maybe you're here this morning and you have that relationship, but you've let it grow cold. You don't talk to the Lord the way you used to. You don't allow the Lord to talk to you the way that you used to. Communication is so very important. Maybe this morning you just need to come and renew that relationship with him. Whatever your need is, when we sing this first verse of invitation, why don't you come? Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your love and goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for this message on faith and challenging our hearts. Lord, I pray, God, that you'd help us to be like that servant in Dothan. Lord, help, Lord, to open up our eyes. Lord, help us to see, Heavenly Father, Lord, what you want us to see in our lives. Lord, help us to do your bidding. For we ask this in your precious name. Amen.